Good evening, everybody, and thanks for, for tuning in. This is our first Zoom presentation, so hopefully it will all go well. Um, so as you can see from this first picture, our presentation is about Yellowstone. Um, in January, we were fortunate enough to go to um, Yellowstone National Park, and this picture shows probably the most famous uh, feature at Yellowstone, which is Old Faithful Geyser. I mean, Yellowstone itself was the world's um, first national park established in March 1872. And uh, due to its unique geology, it supports a surprising number of species throughout the year. Um, so in this presentation, we'll be talking about the impact of wolf reintroduction and also giving you an insight into what you can see during the winter in Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is about 3,500 square miles in size and it uh, straddles three states. Um, the main part is in Wyoming with uh, smaller sections in Montana and Idaho. And I've put this uh, map into the presentation just to give a bit of orientation in case, you know, for anybody who's not familiar with the National Park. Um, Yellowstone is pretty famous, I think, for sitting on top of a large volcano um, with a caldera, which is, is pretty big. It's 30 by 45 miles. And on the map, you just see that kind of shaded um, squiggly outline, which is the, the caldera. And so a lot of the tourist kind of attractions sit, you know, right on top of the volcano. So obviously when we visited, we were hoping it wasn't going to go off at that point. Um, being on top of a volcano um, means that you have lots of geothermal activity in the area. So going in January to Yellowstone, it's obviously smack bang in the middle of winter. And so the accessibility is limited. There's one road in the north, which is open to cars with winter tires. Um, and the only other routes that you can use are only accessible by um, either a snow coach, which has huge tires, or by track vehicles. So during our visit, we stay, we were based in three different locations. The first near the northern entrance, which is if you can see the number one on the top of the map. So we stayed just outside the park and then spent several days traveling to and fro um, from Mammoth Hot Springs along the Lamar Valley, which is number 25. Um, the second part of the uh, stay was right in the park by Old Faithful and from there we were able to explore the western area up to uh, Madison which is number four on the map. The final part of our stop was in a yurt camp which sounds quite interesting because it was quite obviously below um, or sub-zero temperatures at the time. Um, but the, it was probably our favourite place that we stayed um, because it was so remote and miles away from the nearest hotel. So when we went out on our daily excursions to the Hayden Valley, um, it did mean that we got there before anybody staying in the hotels at Old Faithful. So I've talked a bit about the park geography. Um, let's talk about wolves. So following wolf extirpation in the 1920s, um, the elk population exploded. Uh, scientists also began to notice other signs of, you know, degradation, erosion and, and plant death. Um, and from these observations, it led to a better sort of understanding of the role of large predators in order to have a healthy ecosystem. Um, but it was quite a few years later, not until the Endangered Species Act of 1973, that legal reintroduction of wolves became a possibility. So move forward to January the 12th, 1995, and the first eight grey wolves arrived in Yellowstone from Jasper National Park in Canada. Um, shortly after that, another six arrived also from Canada. And then by the end of the following year, a further 17 wolves had been transferred to the park. Of course, the reintroduction hadn't been, you know, without controversy or difficulty. When they um, brought the wolves in, they were concerned that they would revert to their normal homing instinct, which would lead them all the way back to Canada, potentially. So to try and mitigate this, they had um, uh, some acclimatization pens in which they provided elk carcasses. 
to try and encourage them to sort of stay put and not return back to Canada. Um, this was um, sort of partially successful. Unfortunately, one of the original alpha males was illegally killed outside of the park because obviously once they're outside of the park, they didn't have the level of protection. So, but the, but the fortunate thing was that the, the pregnant alpha female was retrieved and returned to the park and late, later um, successfully had a litter of pups. So um, from 2009, the wolf numbers have um, grown and somewhere between 83 and 108, they sort of fluctuate up and down each year. Um, I think co the current numbers are about 94 um, this year. And the pack, the, um, the wolves are comprised of packs. It's about eight packs, although again, the numbers do shift as the wolves kind of move back and forth um, uh, from one pack to another. And the packs obviously change sizes depending on their level of success. Um, when we visited Yellowstone, we, we didn't really know too much about the, we knew wolves had been reintroduced, but we didn't know too much about the details. But so we were really happy, you know, to discover that we were actually there on the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the wolf in reintroduction programme. But of course, what we were even happy about was to actually see some wolves ourselves. We, the, the telltale signs were that we saw a large group of people with scopes all trained in one direction. And, you know, we were hoping it was going to be wolves and it was. And um, as you can tell from this picture, which isn't the best, it's rather grainy, but it was taken on sort of telephoto lens because they were quite a long way away. But hopefully you can make out that that is a, a pack of wolves or part of a pack of wolves. And in this case, the wolf pack is called Eight Mile Pack, and it's one of the larger packs in the um, in the park at the moment. And we, we really did enjoy watching the uh, the wolves, and even though they were quite a way off, you could see them interacting together, and you know you could see some of the typical sort of wolf behaviour before they sort of loped off through the snow. So wolf, um, the wolf in reintroduction has resulted in a number of changes in the park. Um, which I'm going to take you through on the next few slides. So prior to wolf reintroduction, as I mentioned earlier, the elk numbers had reached a real saturation point and they were peaking at nearly 20,000 um, animals. Um, Overgrazing had become a really significant problem and required sort of human intervention through licensed hunting. Um, it kind of when I was thinking about this, it sort of makes you think about the proposals for wolf reintroduction in Scotland to, to control sort of deer numbers. Um, so when the wolves were introduced, um, there were some fears that they would wipe out the elk entirely, but instead um, numbers have stabilized. So the elk numbers sort of about six to 8,000. Um, in fact, the wolves, because they thinned out the sort of weaker elk, um, they've created a more resilient herd, um, which leads to sort of fewer mass, mass deaths during the hard winters, which is what was observed previously. And this in itself has some, some benefits. So the, um, the elk's now at a more you know, manageable number. Um, but not only that, their behaviour has changed. Um, and this has resulted in improvements to the environment and benefits for other animals within the park. So for example, um, the elk, because they know the wolves are around, they behave very differently and they, they won't stay and graze perhaps so much in certain areas and they'll move around more. Um, this has meant that the, um, they don't feed in the same spot. So the previously overgrazed, the willow, the aspen, the cottonwood has been given the opportunity to recover. Um, species such as this moose, they have benefited from regrowth of food sources such as willow. And um, one of the more surprising success stories has been the increase in number of beavers in Yellowstone. It's gone from one to nine colonies. And this is due to the willow bounce back, which obviously provided um, an abundant food source for the beaver. Um, and I think again makes me think of the um, planned reintroduction of beavers in Darsha that's due to go ahead shortly um, you know with the intended um, 
growth of beaver population, it ha can have so many sort of positive effects. And in Yellowstone, the um, the growth in the beaver numbers has led it has led to improved storage of water for recharging the water table. Um, it's evened out the seasonal runoff. Um, also improving the provision of cold shady water for the fish in the watercourses and it's also created more robust willow stands which provide a great habitat for a number of different songbirds. Um, another consequence of the presence of wolves in Yellowstone is that their dominance has seen a reduction in coyotes although they do still they're still present in um, you know significant numbers. The um, coyotes have returned to a more typical social organisation of pairs with pups, uh, rather than the packs that had existed um, when the wolves had been exterminated in Yellowstone. So, you know, although there's been a sort of slight decline in coyote numbers, um, th this may have had a sort of reverse effect of increasing number of foxes, which are sighted in the um, core wolf areas uh, such as around the Lamar Valley. So during our stay we saw you know quite a few coyote at each of the locations that we that we visited and um, we saw for example a pair of coyote that were you know walking along the river's edge or the roadside and they they weren't at all bothered by us. Obviously we kept our distance but they weren't at all bothered by the presence of vehicles. Um, the one in this photo has a bit of a story. Um, it, it's um, not such a, it was, the photo was taken with it relatively close, but it wasn't because we were getting close to it, it just that it came quite close to our group, in fact, too close, and we had to move. Um, the reason for this became apparent sort of a bit later is if you look really careful at the face, you can see that the, um, the muzzle is peppered with porcupine quills. And we believe this is what's um, caused this unusual behaviour. Um, on several occasions, we were fortunate to see coyotes sort of hunting for small mammals um, beneath the snow. I mean, you basically sort of see them stop and you see their ears twitching, um, trying to pinpoint the direction of their prey. And then they'll sort of jump sort of nose first into the snow. Uh, you can see this one's definitely got something in its uh, jaws. Um, in fact, it did. It was pretty successful. It kept sort of diving and then reappearing with what were probably voles, you know, one after another. Um, felt can't help but feel a little bit sorry for the voles. So another sort of um, animal occupying a sort of similar sort of space in um, Yellowstone is the red fox, which you can see is, is it's very much like our own red fox, um, apart from the sort of thick wintry coat. Um, like our urban foxes, many of them were entirely, you know, non plus by our presence and in fact they demonstrated just distinct confidence. Um, watching the successful hunt of the coyote may have been quite impressive, but nothing really compares to the balletic prowess of a mousing fox. Um, we saw this, we've seen this before we went to Yellowstone on lots of nature documentaries and we were really desperate to um, be able to see this for ourselves in action. So the question is, um, did we? And the answer is yes. So this um, is a composite photo, so um, which we put together um, showing the different action, different actions of the fox when it's mousing. Um, although not every jump is successful, and a lot of the time it just you know pops his head back up covered in snow. Um, we did see quite a few successful hunts. Um, in fact, we spent quite a few hours watching foxes training across the snow, looking for the signs that they were going to start mousing. And then um, the fox, like the coyote, would stop and tilt its head, listen, crouch low, and then suddenly spring up again. And then uh, this would culminate in the head, you know, often disappearing entirely, you know, into the snow. Um, it, it was a real highlight of the of the holiday. Um, other animals that benefit from the um, the trophic cascade of wolf reintroduction are the opportunists, such as this raven. Um, similarly, eagles, magpies, and bears all all take advantage of the carcasses left by wolves. 
Um, the scavenger type animals in the park have previously relied upon winter killed elk in those sort of mass deaths. Um, now they depend much more on wolf killed elk. Um, and this means the, the sort of carcasses are more equitably distributed. Uh, one of the more significant benefits um, of the wolf reintroduction has been the increased income into the park. Um, there's about 4 million visitors annually to Yellowstone and many of them are drawn to see the, the wolves particularly. Um, 10 years after the wolves were reintroduced, the University of Montana conducted a regional economic analysis and they estimated that more than $35.5 million are generated via the wolf-centred ecotourism, which seemed quite a lot of money to me. And that goes into the sort of the, the parks sort of surrounding gateway communities. Um, in fact, when we were there, obviously in winter, um, there, we saw lots of people specifically touring the park to, to have a look at the wolves. So that's me done talking about wolf reintroduction. And now I'm going to hand over to Stephen to show you a bit more of um, Yellowstone in the winter. Hi. Um, so the temperatures in Yellowstone um, can vary from about minus 20 in the winter to 30 degrees uh, in the summer, with the lowest recorded temperature being minus 54. Fortunately, it wasn't that cold when we were there. Um, we got down to about minus 10 during the day. Um, but it, it's a dry cold, so you know, after wrapping up, it was uh, not too bad. Um, so what makes a special, this place so special are the uh, geothermal features. Um, so aside from the continually evolving landscape, there's fumaroles, geysers, mud pools, and hot springs. Um, and the, these warm underground conditions provide a, an added benefit to the local wildlife, particularly during the coldest months. Um, so these conditions prevent the rivers from freezing and keep some areas uh, snow free. So it's ideal for the animals that live and feed along the waterways. Uh, so we saw this otter and its uh, two family members in the Hayden Valley. Um, they led, led us a merry dance as we were walking and running along the uh, road with all our camera equipment. Um, and they were just uh, you know, swimming up and down um, with a nice easy pace and just running along the snow and the ice. Um, it was really fantastic to watch them hunt and frolic together. Um, they were sliding down snowy slopes and popping out of ice holes. Um, but quite often after catching a fish, so we've got to see them in the fish as well. Um, so the, the ice-free waterways also provide um, ideal conditions for a variety of different um, birds, such as the uh, American Dipper. Um, uh, hooded Maganza, also there's common Magansas as well. Um, common and Barrows Golden Light, I think it's one of each in the, that picture, um, and also Buffleheads as well, which weren't in that one. Um, we also saw a ring neck duck and uh, trumpeter swans. So the national emblem of the United States, the bald eagle, makes the most of uh, what Yellowstone has to offer, um, feeding primarily on fish, but also on waterfowl and uh, carrion. Um, this eagle had found an ideal perch, as we saw him every time we passed by. So probably about 10 or 15 times we saw him <laughs> sat in the same spot. Um, but in 2016, biologists uh, monitored uh, 14 um, active nests. So it, it, there's a reasonable number in, in the park. So bison are one of the other iconic species to be found in uh, Yellowstone. And they're well, ad well adapted to the extreme conditions. Um, you can obviously see their big, thick coats. Um, but it's not just that. Their large shoulder and neck muscles um, allow them to clear the snow um, with sweeping head, head movements like a snow play in the search for grasses and sedges. Um, so despite being the largest land mammal uh, in North America, with males reaching nearly a tonne, they are agile, they're strong swimmers and can run at 35 miles an hour. Surprisingly, they can jump over obstacles about five feet high, although I don't think you ever saw any take, taking off the ground. So. <laughs> They've also got excellent hearing, vision, and a sense of smell, which obviously they use for to try and find the uh, the grass. Um, now, although most of the wolf uh, Yellowstone wolf packs prefer to attack the smaller prey, such as elk, and um, the the bison uh, have started to be predated more, um, and that's 
probably due to the bigger pack sizes of wolves, um, with, the, with the you know larger wolf packs having numbers to uh, tackle the, the bigger animals. So this picture shows one example of the interrelationship between the different species within the park. Um, so here you can see the snow has been um, dug up by the uh, bison um, uh, and that's actually making it easier for the coyote to try and hunt the, uh, the small prey. And I think the foxes take some advantage of that. But I think it's more of a coyote thing. Um, so the, the thermal areas are a benefit for the bison as well. Um, so they provide snow free access to all the plants. So that saves them the uh, effort of having to plow, plow through all the snow. Um, but it comes at a cost um, because the water and the soil and the plants often contain uh, elevated levels of fluoride, which can be harmful to the animals. Also, the vegetation around the hot springs becomes uh, coated in a silica deposit, um, which gradually wear down the teeth. Um, and that can actually end up shortening the lifespan of the bison by as much as four years. Um, but this uh, chemical makeup of the uh, geothermal does not only impact the bison. Um, so these uh, bobby sox trees, um, so, so named for the uh, distinctive white markings at the base, um, but they're the signs of a slow death for the trees. So these lodgepole pines um, have soaken up the mineral laden water. Um, and when that water then evaporates, the minerals are left behind, turning the lower the portion of the trees white and eventually killing them. But it's not all bad. The uh, hot springs support their own mini ecosystems. Um, the iconic colours often resulting from the presence of particular types of thermophilic bacteria. Um, the discovery of one particular bacteria in the 1960s, Thermus aquaticus, led to the discovery of thermostable enzymes and the invention of the PCR or polymerase chain reaction, uh, which is used in DNA sequencing and also used for uh, the current COVID-19 saliva testing. So we hope it's been uh, apparent from our presentation how much we really enjoyed what Yellowstone had to offer. The advantage of being there in the winter is that the uh, park was so much quieter, um, allowing quality time with the wildlife. Uh, but unlike the uh, summer period, the only traffic jams we uh, saw were uh, caused by the, the bison meandering along the road. Although the wolf reintroduction program has not been without controversy um, due to the animals' conflict with livestock outside the park and impacts on hunting quotas, it's not hard to see as it's all been an overall success. We can but hope that programmes close to home, such as DWT's plan to reintroduce beavers to the uh, Wellington Wetlands Reserve, can bring about positive improvements to people as well as the environment. Um, so, um, opening it up for any questions. Um, Pat, I think you had your hand up as a, with questions. You mentioned that um, quite had had an effect on the local people around about. Are these sort of indigenous peoples, like um, American Indians, or are they we, average American? I think they're probably the average American. We, we didn't yeah. see much of a, much evidence of um, indigenous peoples in the area. I'm sure there probably mm. are some, but. Um, I think there are probably people who've just moved in and taken advantage of the um, people with, probably with a bit of money who've taken advantage of the sort of tourist situation. Obviously right. staying there in the winter, there aren't actually that many um, hotels and things open. Uh, but obviously we've been told by our fellow travel travellers who've been in the summer that the place was obviously heaving. So there's no doubt plenty of money to be made from all of the um, uh, the tour Tourism, operators yeah. as well as the kind of hotels and cafes and so on um, is a bit more limited in the in the winter. I mean the people we stayed with at the Yurt camp were really excellent, really excellent guides and very knowledgeable. I think they've been running their operation for some like 20 years and they have special permits which means the the camp is effectively removable so it doesn't you know damage the environment it can be put back to as it mm. was it's yeah. sort of it. every year they take it down in the spring and uh, put, put it back up again <laughs> put it back up again in the winter so mm -hmm. sorry rachel you mentioned somebody else had another question i, I, I wondered whether um I, I saw linda briggs had put her hand up but i don't know whether that was with a question 
it's hard to see with all the, the faces uh, on the screen. If, uh, mm. yeah, yeah. No, other, other, Jill. Oh, it's Laverne. Is it Laverne? Yes. Do you have a question? Yes. I um I, I always think about uh, climate uh, change. Uh, do you see any negative effects regarding uh, climate change? Climate change, did you say? And um, we did we did um, ask our local guides about climate change, and I don't think they were. I think probably one of the things that was mentioned was the around the tree line because obviously the. There didn't seem to have been many very severe winters in the last mm. few years, but obviously it's only quite a small period of time in recent years to know whether that's a significant change or not. But I, I think they have seen some changes in um, uh, numbers of certain species of pines that are that sort of would live at higher up, at higher altitudes, and probably in their more severe conditions. Um, but I think that's we didn't. Yeah ourselves see anything that was obviously um as a result of climate change okay. negatively that is okay thanks for your question jill jill williamson you have another question yes um did the jasper national park people send an entire pack to Yellowstone or were wolves picked from various packs and then left to form their own new packs when they arrived? I think they were probably taken from the same pack because there's normally that dominance but I I believe they did I'm not sure how much how targeted it was because I believe they put out traps to, to pick up the wall so it may there may have been a bit of both going on there I'm not quite sure how the um, social sort of behaviours work out if you bring through I would imagine there's a danger if you don't have sort of dominant uh, wolves whether there would be the sufficient character and strength of some other wolves to kind of work through I mean re reading around the subjects so the only the only wolf that seems to sort of miss out was that one that had basically left the park and interestingly um, the uh, states within the National Park and those that are outside of the National Park have, have fairly recently been through cycles of, because the wolves have come back in, in enough numbers, they've kind of, they're not so, you know, endangered. And a lot of the parks, because people are worried about their cattle, they've lobbied to have it reversed so that you could shoot wolves or, you know, kill wolves when they're outside the park. And I believe some that have been tagged have also, mm -hmm. they've known because some of the tagged ones have been killed. But it keeps flipping back and forth between you are allowed to kill them and you aren't allowed to kill them, depending on which state and obviously probably where the money is in terms of um, people, you know, wanting to. Um, yeah, there's a lot of um, farming that goes on just outside of the park boundaries. Yeah, um, and, and, and oh, you know, they, they, they lots of ranches and uh, they do a lot of um, bison farming there for food. As but well. there are some that are. Um, you know, more more sort of um, in sync with the the balance in the the wild environment. They're not all ranchers who want to sort of shoot everything dead. And certainly, our our it was a sort of photographic trip that we went on. And our trip leader, he, he says, some of his friends were you know seeing all sorts of amazing wildlife on their doorstep um, because they're you know they're not sort of scaring off if you like. Um, and I think also the evidence is is there because we've had 25 years of wolves in that they're not that it's not all bad yes that some of the um the livestock is lost but not in probably the numbers that the ranchers were really concerned about mm. right, thank you any other questions okay yeah. right well um Louise and Stephen, thank you very much indeed. I thought the photographs were fantastic and your talk was really, really illuminating. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, can I suggest now that we take a, a five minute break and pick up again at quarter two um, with Andy's talk on the Isle of Mull. Um, so stay, stay tuned, stay here, um, but we'll be back with the next talk in five minutes time. Thank you. Right. So um, hopefully everybody's back. 
Um, and our second talk of the evening is Andy Gregory. Uh, and Andy, you're going to talk to us about the Isle of Mull and the wildlife, I think. Right, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Right, this talk's mainly about the wildlife on Mull. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour around. And some of the images I'm going to explain how the way I've shared information has benefited to other people and vice versa. And uh, three or four pictures at the end from other places on the similar topic. First of all, whenever we, we've been up to Mull three times now, and we always stop at Oban. And we've seen uh, black guillemots up there a couple of times, which on the last visit, we were just getting back to where we'd parked the car and we noticed them um, going in and out of holes in the sea wall. And uh, we managed to, I went and got another ticket for the car, for the car park and grabbed my camera and came back. And we had some really good views of those at the north end of town there where the, um, there's like a theatre and a car park. If you just go down to the, the edge of the sea there, the in and out of the, the holes. Now, no expense spared with this map. It's an old tea towel that we bought in Tobermory. <laughs> uh, for anybody that doesn't know, Oban's off to the uh, right hand side here and we get the ferry to Craig Newell. Uh, we usually sort of come down this bottom part of Mull. On our first trip we were down in the Ross of Mull, right down at a place here called Ushkin. A uh, couple of pictures sort of down there on Iona. And then to my mind the best places for wildlife are the top of Loch Screeton and up on Loch Nakeel is by far and away the best for eagles and otters. Now, uh, the first time we went was in September, which was 2011 when we stayed here. Then the following trip was in July, uh, June in 2013. We stayed in a little cottage right at the side of the water in a bay here, at Kilfinnican Bay. And then the third trip, we were on the south side of Loch Nakeel. Uh, a nice cottage just slightly up the hillside, but with lots of wildlife about and easy walk down to the side of the lock. Now, we, we've got otters going to show you up here and sea eagles down here. The RSPB Eagle Nest Watch was here, but on our last, that was on our second visit. On the last visit, most of the forest had been cut down. Uh, and I think the right up at the top near Derveig, they had the eagle watch there. We'll uh, just move on now. This was a, a yellow hammer uh, right outside the caravan we were staying in on the first visit in the remnant of a drizzly rain shower. Um, you can see all sorts. When, when you're on Mull, it seems to be a totally different uh, way of living up there. Lots more wildlife to be seen. You never know what you're going to come across. And on each visit, we go across to Iona from Fiam Put on the short ferry ride over. The first time we didn't see or hear any corn crakes. The second time we uh, heard one right near the, the ferry terminal, but we never saw any. It was in such thick undergrowth. And then on the third trip, we'd walked up the road past the uh, St. Columbus Abbey. And we ended up with three of them in different places in the farmland all around us. And this one, I was photographing across a, a close cropped field where the sheep had nibbled all the grass down. And right at the edge of this fence in this real thick flower meadow at the other side, luckily it was right at the edge and I could hear it calling. And I've cropped the image to, to show it, but it's the only time I've been able to photograph one. And on a walk round the Isle of Iona there, we were surprised to see this, what I think is a sedge warbler. And it kept coming and going with uh, food in its beak, it must have had young nearby. Um, so a bit of a surprise that one was. Now, on the September visit, we're going up to the top of Loch Screeton and the weather washes a lot of seaweed up and sort of high and dry. And I was lying on the floor taking this, a uh, ring plover. We had uh, turnstones, um, several other little waders flying about there. It's a good, a good place to see those. 
Now, talking about sharing information, prior to our first visit, as a, an acquaintance of mine, Craig Jones is a professional wildlife photographer, lives down there, Stoke-on-Trent. And he came up and met me near Derbyshire Bridge and I was telling him all the places I'd been photographing short-eared owls. And he asked me to bring me a map of Mull up and he marked out different places where we might see certain things, owls and eagles and things. So this was the first day out from down on the Ross of Mull. We drove up around the top end of Loch Street and pulled up in a little car park, walked across the road, no sign of anything. Um, high, high tide, I'm not sure if it was just coming to the top of high tide or just starting to ebb. Uh, perfectly sort of mirror calm water. And I'd just bent down to, I'd found a single bog asphodel flower and I'd just bent down to smell it because I like the smell of clothes. And Janet said, what's that? She'd looked across my back and could see this stream of bubbles coming towards us. And I stood up and it was an otter. And it was just coming straight towards us. We were stood up on these rocks about four foot above the water. And sort of ducked down, took some photographs. It walked right beneath my feet, about four foot below my feet. And it must have caught wind of us. It went past us, leapt in the water, swam out. Took several photographs, thought, oh, brilliant, good start to the holiday, and was walking back to the car. And I thought, hang on a minute, we've gone to all this trouble going all the way to Mull to see an otter, and it was still out in the bay. So I went and got my tripod, we walked back down onto the shingle beach, and it swam round in a big arc and came out on these rocks and started preening, and we were there for quite a while, and other people came to join us. And this is my favourite picture of, of all the lot. But I don't think we'd have got it if we hadn't have had the information from my friend. Now, this is just a bit further down the north side of Loch Screeton when we were staying on our second trip, little cottage just around the corner. I'd gone out early in the morning and single track tarmac road and all little bits of gravel in the middle. And there's lots of birds feeding and looking for stuff in the gravel. And I pulled up. And they were crossbills, and it's the, the one, and well, the, the only time I've seen them is up there. And we went out again, I don't know it's later that day or the following day, and we saw them in the same place, and they flew up into the trees, and we got out and managed a few photographs. This is the, the male, the female was nearly green coloured, but they were like little parrots they were. Now, this and the next picture are rubbish pictures, but I've gone out at quarter past ten at night, and I took a glass of whiskey and my camera went and sat on a rock at the side of the lock, only a few yards from the cottage, and just sat there. And I suddenly turned around, looked in the corner of the bay, and I thought, oh, there's a gull coming. And I thought, hang on a minute, it's a male hen harrier. So I hadn't really set up my camera properly, and the light was going. And I just grabbed that shot and this shot, and uh, then it sort of just went off around the corner. And that's the only time I've ever seen a, a male hen harrier there. I think we've seen a female one once, and it's supposed to be quite good at the top of Loch Street and on the grasslands just away from the head of the lock, but we, we've not had very good uh, sort of views of them. Now, white-tailed sea eagle here. This was just up only about a mile from the, the cottage we were staying in. We paid to go on a RSPB eagle watch trip. It was only about six and a half pounds, and we parked up, walked, about three quarters of a mile down the forest track and then went up the bank under the trees above the track and you could look about 150 yards down this gap in the trees and there was the nest with uh, just one chick there and this is the, the females brought I thought it was just vegetation but uh, the chick started uh, grabbing bits out of it and there you can see it pulling at some sort of uh, sinews or meat or whatever it was we, we did have the male come in as well, but it was always behind the branches and didn't make a very good photograph. And the chap that was uh, giving this other talk and leading the group for the RSPB, a chap called John Clare, and he'd given us all this information. And then I showed him some of the pictures on my camera and he asked if he could have one or two for his uh, blog site on, on the island. And I said, yes, sort of sharing things again there. He wrote uh, quite a few little guidebooks and things down there. 
Now this was the day after I was up on the, the road which goes over the island to Loch Nakeel and it's not far from the cottage we're staying in and I've got a 300 mil lens on and I looked up there in the direction where we'd been and there's the eagle's nest and the chick sat on it and that, that's just taken from the road and if we hadn't have been there on the trip we wouldn't have known it was there, we'd have just kept driving past it. Now th that was up on the day we'd been looking at the eagles, uh, a male siskin and uh, we just sat, they had a, a big shed, sort of an information place for teaching children all about the eagles. We were sat at a picnic table and these were on the branches right next to us. And uh, they always seem more brightly coloured up there than any I've seen down here. Uh, amazing little birds they are. And we moved over onto Loch Nakeel for our third visit, again in June. And this was taken through the bedroom window, like French windows, and it opened out onto a view looking up to Ben Moor, which is the, the highest mountain, a uh, Munro up there, and views up, up the loch. And we, we had all sorts of little birds, this is a juvenile wheat here, which was uh, outside. We had a, a load of cows and a big bull coming, flying down outside the bedroom window, and the young swallows on the wall outside. It was amazing what you could just see. Twite, we'd been down on the rocky shore, just walked down from the cottage to Loch Nakeel, and one evening we'd seen, as I tell they looked like sparrows in the distance, feeding on the seeds and grasses and other plants. And then I sort of took some photos and blew them up and had a look, and I told them it looked more like twite. And I'd been out for a walk one, one evening, I think, down to the side of the loch, and this is only a few yards from the back of the cottage. The, on a wire, I've cropped two more youngsters out on the left. But this is a, the male on the left here, just about to feed a ball of seeds to one of the youngsters there. And it was a lot of bracken around and a, a stone wall. And I'm sure they, they nested there because we saw them several times. Down on the, the rocky shore again, just below where we were staying, a pair of uh, common sandpipers on one occasion. You just see the lighting coming in from the left as the sun's setting down the bottom of the, the lock above uh, the island of Ulver. Now we did see one chick on one occasion when we were down in this area. Now when you're wandering around the side of the locks on Mull, especially at the right time of year, if you see in here oyster catchers getting a bit aggravated and flying around or on the ground making a lot of noise, if you loot round, you have to be very careful, you'll see the, the chicks there. Um, we've seen them on a couple of occasions, but this was the closest to ever managed to get. It's very hard to pick out with all the different coloured rocks and seaweed. And moving further up near the, the head of uh, Loch Nakeel, there's a, a lay-by just before the road veers away from the loch and goes round through Gruline and Knock House, and goes around the head of the loch and comes back on the other side. And there was always um, cars parked there, a couple of cars and a couple of motorhomes and people with telescopes. And we'd stop one day and got talking to them. And there was a pair of eagles nesting on the, the hillside. And uh, this is one of the pair that was flying around the, the first time we saw them. And then right on the opposite side of the lock is where the, the sea eagles live and nest up in the trees above Kellen. Now, this is on the opposite side, below where the eagles, the sea eagles nest. And um, we'd been there for a while in this lay-by, looking around for things. It was low tide, quite an area of rock, rocks and seaweed in front of us. And we'd been talking to a French couple. And again, this business about sharing information, we'd been telling them where we'd seen things and seen otters around the other side and eagles. And we got in the car and we were just waiting a bit and we thought, oh, blow it, we'll, we'll go, there's nothing happening here. And I was just about to turn the key in the car and this French woman we'd been talking to came running up, waving at us and otter, otter. So I leapt out the car, closed in the doors quietly, grabbed the camera and we had 45 minutes with this single otter as it was sliding round through the seaweed and looking for things to eat and coming up with uh, butterfish and crabs. And it always reminds me, every time I look at this with a seaweed over it, 
the um, TV programme, the, the Fast Show, with uh, Mark Williams, the actor, when he used to come out of his little shed. Today I'll be wearing mainly seaweed, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> I wish I have, have a laugh. But again, if we hadn't been talking to this French couple, they wouldn't have bothered coming telling us and we'd have driven off and, and we'd have never seen that. The following day, it was the, the last day of our last trip and we were booked on a, a boat trip to go out to uh, Bingle's Cave and Lunga, uh, leaving from um, Ulver Ferry. And on the way there, it was a, a sort of late morning start fr from the jetty. So we had time to stop off in the lay-by we'd seen the otter the day before. And this is more of a case of a bit of knowledge on my part part as to seeing a boat coming up that I knew was the, the charter boat where they had photographers on and they threw fish out for the, the eagles to come and there was a couple next to us over the other side of a car who were trying the very best not to let us hear what they were saying and I was turning away and listening carefully and the, the woman was saying oh it's up there at the top of the hill in this tree right at the top so I casually turned around and looked up there and there's this eagle perched in the tree and I'd seen the Lady Jane coming, this um, charter boat. So I was waiting and waiting. And then the eagle took off. And it, it, it's just waiting for the boat, the eagle is waiting to be fed. And it came flying down straight over us, out into the bay. And this has cropped quite a bit because it was right out in the lock. You can see the road up the other side there. All the photographers in there. I think that's Martin Kievers, the, the owner of it, the skipper. And him and his son are quite uh, good photographers now. And um, the eagles just grabbed hold of the fish, big splash there. We watched it coming flying round, come in, it's grabbed it. Everybody's taking the pictures. It came back round and I nearly fell over backwards. I was looking vertically above me uh, as it came right over with the fish in its talons. And it flew up, landed in a tree and started eating it. But we had to set off on our trip to uh, out to the Treshnish Islands. Uh, we'd been for a walk round Fingal's Cave. They dropped us off there, which was very interesting. Back on the boat and out to the uh, the islands. Now, longer, I can recommend a visit there, but if you're bad on your feet, don't go near it. They let you off. They, they moor up next to a, a little um, floating pontoon, fasten it on the side of the boat go up to the side of the beach or the rocks and you climb off onto the, the rocks and there's a huge boulder field where you're perching from, from one boulder to another and it really is very sort of iffy that is but it's, it's worth it if you can do it. Now I took this picture of another photographer he's actually photographing a bird just off the edge there another puffin and it just shows you you don't need a big lens to photograph them there. The cliffs are in two or three tiers and you walk up a path to it, up through the, the lower tier and onto a terrace, a flat grass terrace on the top of the cliff. And you've got puffins everywhere and you can get decent pictures of them with, uh, this is with a 300mm lens, you can fill the frame with pictures of them sat down or I'd swap lenses, I'd wide angle shots of them about three or four foot in, in front of me. You have to be careful where you were kneeling and sitting because uh, you might collapse the rabbit holes that they, they were living in. There's still some rabbits in some of the, the holes. And we were very lucky to see our first ever puffling. It just stuck his head up like that. And we saw about two or three of these little ones just venturing out, flapping the wings and going back again. You can still see a lot of the, the downy feathers on them. Now this one, I'd already seen uh, the Bonksy, the great skewer flying about and th this woman, she just went right off the path where everybody else was, up onto the top of the next layer of cliffs and was obviously getting too close to where the skewers were nesting and this one came down and uh, it didn't get too close to her head but it wasn't far off, she, she was a bit lucky there. Uh, this is the last image from Mull. It's a, a mink. Now, I was driving along south side of Loch Nakeel. We'd just come under the, the rocky bit, my favourite bit of road. And I looked over the, this low wall right into the side of the lock. And I thought, oh, there's an otter there. So I pulled up quickly up the road, grabbed my camera, ran back. 
and I could see this something had caught a fish, still thinking it was an otter. Looking through the camera and the lens, and it looked like a sea monster, this thing, pink thing, flat thrashing about, and I was still convinced it was an otter. And it disappeared around a, a headland, about sort of 15 foot high, rocky headland, not far out. And I was sort of just looking at the camera, and then I noticed this mink suddenly appear without the fish, looked about, make sure the coast was clear, went back down the rocks again, and then came over with this fish, and it was dragging it across all these rocks. There was a common sandpiper on the top of a rock to one side, calling away, having a right fit, didn't like this being nearby, I must have had young near the place and I took several pictures of it coming down the rocks and it just disappeared under the rocks so I don't know if it had uh, young of its own hidden away somewhere and we'll just leave Mull now and on the business we're still in Scotland on the business of sharing information this is on um, Channery Point on the Black Isle just up from uh, Inverness and it's the best place to go and watch dolphins but you, you really got to be there at the right time. Now, on our last vi visit up there, we were staying for a week on the Black Isle, and I went every day at least once, and I didn't see much on the first couple of visits, and there's a chap up there called Charlie Phillips. He's been on lots of TV programmes, people interviewing him about the dolphins. He works for the Whale and Dolphin Conservation, and he's just brought a, brought a book out a while ago called On a Rising Tide which is the information he passed to me when I saw him. I was just leaving. He was just arriving in the car park. I knew who it was, so I went and had a word. And he says the best time to come is when the tide's turned and just starting to rise, hence the name of his book. So once I knew that, every time I went at the right time, we uh, soon saw some good action and got some good photographs. And then... I took this picture of him a day or two later, I've cropped some people out on either side, and I posted it when I got home and uh, called him the Doyen of Dolphins, and he, he liked the picture and he emailed me and asked if he could uh, use it on his website, so I thought, you know, he's given me the information, so I'll repay him with that. Uh, two more pictures to go, Steve Orridge will perhaps remember this, uh, a while back uh, he posted on Facebook one evening that uh, he'd seen just seen a tony owl in, in Buxton in somebody's front garden. So I grabbed my camera, got in the car and shot down. I think it lands down road up uh, near where the old um, driving test place used to be. And I was looking up and down and I couldn't see this blooming owl. And then all of a sudden I just looked lower down right in front of me and there it was in this tree at more or less eye level. So if Steve hadn't to share the information, I'd have never got that shot. And then to finish with, this is down on Bottoms Reservoir, which was um, last year. I've taken lots of pictures of the, the same family again this year. But there's a, a chap, a, a postman from Broken Cross called Paul Beach, and he has quite a following on Facebook. And he's always posting pictures of them nesting and the eggs and the chicks. and I got in touch with him last year and he sort of kept me up to date of sort of when the eggs were hatching and different things. It wasn't far from the road, right up at the head end of the, the reservoir, this, near a little parking space. You just walk across the road, set your camera up and, and get some good shots. And um, so if it wasn't for him sharing this information, and he's done the same again this year, because they, they lost three, if not four, nests and eggs to the bad weather nesting in the same place at the, the head of the reservoir and then they finally got some common sense went down the, the opposite end to the dam end in the sheltered corner built another nest laid five eggs had five chicks and four have survived this year and he's just looking over the wall you know basically you can just park up walk around and get these fantastic photographs so that's it that's the end of me me talk so if uh, Bit of a whistle stop to all around, but anybody's got any questions? Andy, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, do, you, do you want to take your, your um, screen off? I can unmute. Mm, hang on, let me just stop share. Right, I think that's it. Right, so I'll just unmute everybody. Um, 
<laughs> I think that, that was absolutely fantastic. The photographs were wonderful. And, and you're always so modest about things because you say, well, I just look over the wall and there's a fantastic photo. My photos never look like that, even if I look over many, many walls. Um, but who would like to ask Andy questions about uh, his, his talk or any of his photos or how he, how he manages to take switch photos? Uh, you might need to unmute yourself as well, because although I've unmuted everybody, you might also need to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Any questions? Okay, uh, let's see. Um, I, uh, oh, mm -hmm. I uh, basically had the same question to ask you. Uh, did, did you see any uh, negative, uh, negative effects in that area regarding climate change? Not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, I've not seen anything on the internet or anywhere about it up there. Um, so. I, I, you know, I just know is the answer to be honest. Just things carry on as normal at the moment up there. Peter Croft wanted to ask a question. Yeah, Andy, you got great photos, and and I wonder what, what you've been a few times to Mull now. What would you yeah, recommend um, as being the best time to go uh, for to see the sort of things that you saw? Uh, well, we, we did the first trip was in September and the other two were in June. So we saw quite a few things with youngsters and chicks and things. So I, I think June or July. The other thing to take into account is midges. We were very, very lucky and we never had any problems. I think later July and, and August is when you sort of get them more, I think. So that, that's definitely something to... I mean, on our last trip, I think it was, I did get bitten as we got off the ferry and I dropped my glasses and lost a screw out of them and I thought, oh, great. <laughs> uh, I managed to fix my glasses and we didn't have any problems with midges after that, so <laughs> we were all right. Thanks. Um, uh, Pat? Um, more a comment than a question. Um, one of Mark Cocker's recommendations, um, Framing Nature, Conservation and Culture by Lawrence Rose. Now there's a section in here about the um, white-tailed eagles of Orkney and Mull, but it covers a lot of endangered species. There's a very good chapter on this, so this book was produced this year, so it's brand new out, but I recommend it. Oh, that's great. Very good. Mm. Um, and Andy, I think somebody was, um, I think it's Anne, was asking you um, about what photo equipment you use to get your shots. All those were taken with Canon equipment. I'm on Olympus now and I think my pictures might have been even better because I'm getting better stuff with my Olympus gear. Uh, but the, the older ones on the first two trips had a, a Canon 7D. They were all taken on a 300 F4 with a, a 1.4 converter. Um, the last visit was a, a 7D Mark II. Right. I mean, any cam if, if you go to places like Lunger, I say any cameras and phones, you, you could get brilliant pictures on your phone because they, they're so close, the, the puffing's there. But um, yeah, I mean, it, I think you need something like a 300mm lens at least or a, a, a bridge camera with a, a good zoom on it to, to get to them. A lot of my mm -hmm. pictures are cropped and sort of enlarged them. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, any cameras nowadays, they're all good quality. I would say at the moment, I'm on Olympus, but they, they were all Canon gear there. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, and yeah, I just wonder, I'm not expecting you to know the answer, but wonder whether <coughs> that enormous fish, or it looked enormous, which the mink had, whether you knew what that was. <laughs> I think at the time I did identify it, but I can't remember what it was now. Um, Oh, it's gone. I, I can't remember if it, if it was a, a some sort of a ling, a rock ling or something like that. Yeah. I, I might be wrong, but I, I did look it up. But that's the biggest thing I've ever seen. I've never seen an otter catch anything that size. No. I mean, at, at the time, I didn't realise mink sort of went in the, the seawater, I mean, it's a sea lock, and they must have dived down quite deep there and caught this thing, and it was fighting it, swimming along for about, I don't know, 150 feet, something like that. And it dragged it up about four, five, six foot of rock. 
and then across all these other rocks. And it was as, as long as itself, the fish was, it was huge. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yes, Anne. Uh, do they have water voles in Mull? On Mull? Uh, no, I, I couldn't tell you that. I've never seen them. And I think they don't have badgers, and I don't think they have red squirrels either. But it's just I think are a, a dreadful um, scourge on some of our native wildlife. So, do, do, yeah. do you know if they have any uh, control programs running? The, the, there was something going on. I, I did report it when I got back home to the Otter Group, and they said, "Oh, it's in hand, and you know things are being done." Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was a great. I'm proud of it as a photo, and it was great to see one, but. They're blooming horrible things for what they do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, foot, a moot point, really, with, with them. Mm. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Andy? No? Oh, yes, sorry, Dave. Yep. Do they get pine martin up there, Andy? No. Mm. No, not unless anybody's introduced them. Mm. Yeah. You get them just across the Sound of Mull and the Ardner Merkin and other places, but uh, not not on Mull that I'm aware of. Right. Well, if we're out of questions, um, it just can I just say a quick thank you to all the people that commented about my photos. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and there's there's been there's been some chats in um, you know listing some of the the praise and the thank yous and mm. um, people having enjoyed both talks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I would just like to say um, both to Louise and Stephen and to Andy, thank you so much for the talks. Thank you so much for the quality of your presentation and the quality of your photographs. Um, I've been absolutely fascinated and I hope everybody else has too. And um, so maybe a quick round of applause while we're all... <laughs> thank you. Um, um, could I could I just finish with a reminder um, that if you want to find out more about the talks that we've got, uh, we're on Facebook, uh, Buxton Field Club. Um, if you uh, want to become a member of, of that of, of our Facebook group, you're very very welcome to. We'd love to have you. Um, if you want to join us as a field club um, in sort of real time, if you like, with um, paying real subs. Um, and as I said at the beginning, our next talk is in two weeks time uh, with Patrick Harding about fungi. Um, so look forward to seeing everybody then. Uh, and thank you very much indeed for joining us.